All right, hi, Brandon Feenstra from South Coast Air Quality Management District. That's in the um, Los Angeles uh, Air Basin. And here to talk mostly on the technical side of things, how do you guys get that sensor um, installed, configured, and registered? So you guys are collecting data and doing what you want to do and uh, getting some air monitoring data in your specific location. So just a real quick outline, we're going to talk about air quality, kind of 101, just a couple basics with regards to some definitions. Talk about uh, the Air Quality Sensor Performance Evaluation Center. That is a center that I work in at uh, South Coast. And then we'll talk about the air quality sensor in this project. So first off, um, like any good government organization, we like acronyms. And particulate matter, we'll often refer to that as PM. And there's two different size fractions for particulate matter. And PM10 is 10 microns in size. So if you think of a particle of sand, that's about 90 microns in diameter. And a human hair is 50 to 70 microns. So if you were stacking PM10 particles together, it would take uh, five to seven of those to equal the diameter of a human hair. So we're talking about very small particles, and that's PM10. Those are, in aerosol science, those are the big particles. Um, that we're looking at. PM 2.5 are smaller particles. That would take somewhere um, in the order of 20 to uh, 50, I think, to be the size of a human hair, to do that same diameter. And you can see those are 2.5 microns in size. So those two fractions of particulate matter, particulate matter is dust in the air, are regulated by the US EPA, and they they're under the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And for 24 hour time frame, that's 35 micrograms per cubic meter and 150 micrograms per cubic meter. So since some of those units aren't easy to understand, micrograms per cubic meter and parts per million, if you're looking at gas pollutants, air quality is a lot of times relayed out to the public in an information side of things as an air quality index. This is color scaled from green all the ways to the maroon as hazardous and the scale goes from zero to 500. And you can see the values for PM 2.5 on the far right hand side as well. And then EPA puts this out and there's also health messaging with regards to the different concentrations or AQI index that are being experienced. So this is an example of South Coast Air Quality Management District. This is our jurisdiction. We have roughly 40 air monitoring stations that are putting data into this map. So it's not a very um, spatially resolved map, but this is for regional monitoring to determine whether our basin is in attainment. This is not community monitoring, but regional monitoring with high cost expensive instrumentation. And so we can provide this map out to the public and provide that information as well using the AQI, the air quality index, zero to 500 value. So what does an air monitoring station look like? Well, it's big, it's bulky, and it costs a lot of money to establish. These can cost anywhere from $200,000 to upwards of a million dollars, depending on the instrumentation that is put inside. Some of the specialty instrument, instruments can cost um, in the order of 20,000 all the ways up to hundreds of thousands of dollars when you get into some research grade aerosol uh, instrumentation. So you can see the rack on the right side. This is mostly regulatory air monitors for gases. Um, some of these ones on the top in the middle is gonna be your federal reference monitors for PM 2.5. And so those are kind of the gold standard that's used in the industry for doing regional attainment. So while those do the regional attainment, there's been a push towards low cost sensors in the uh, recent years. And in 2014, a program was established at South Coast Air Quality Management District called AQ Spec. And so the purpose of this program is to evaluate this low cost technology. And what we do is we take those and we deploy them in the field. So just like a citizen scientist, you guys get your sensors, you're gonna deploy it at your home. We're doing that, but we're doing it at a fully regulatory air monitoring station. And we'll run those for two months and we'll see how they evaluate in comparison to our high cost uh, federal equivalent methods. Really the main goals of this program is to provide clarity and guidance to this field. All of the reports that we generate are publicly available on our website, and you can find those at aqmd.gov backslash aqspec. So this is a summary report. 
We do both a field and a laboratory evaluation of low cost sensors. So this includes both. This is a specific summary report for the Purple Air PA2, which is what you guys have in front of you. And you can see the highlights here on how it responded in a two month evaluation in the Riverside Rubido Air Monitoring Station. And so you can see that uh, R square is high. So it correlates well with reference monitors. It does have a slope intercept offset um, that it does have. And there is research in looking into correcting some of that offset. So we received a US EPA STAR grant, Science to Achieve Results grant, um, with specific aims for engaging, educating, and empowering California communities with these low cost sensors. And out of that, a lot of the tools developed in this project are also going to be used in this uh, NASA RTI project as well. And in this, we've deployed 400 of these purple air sensors across 14 communities in California, in the southern, northern, and uh, middle part of California. So here's just a quick map of our sensor deployments. And just to do a real quick air quality awareness exercise, and for particulate matter, first we're gonna ask the audience, what is the temperature in this room? This table right here, 68, good guess. This table here, 70, good guess. Maybe even a little better. All right, we're gonna give you a hint. OSHA recommends maintaining 68 to 76. This table, you guys have a guess? 72, all right, here. All right, so the point of this exercise is that you guys all have a very good recognition of what the temperature is. The thermostat's saying 70 right now, so you guys were correct. Good job. Um, but the idea is, is that we're aware of our temperature around us. So now a little bit harder question. What is a PM 2.5 in micrograms per cubic meter in this room? And we're going to jump off and give the hint right away. Remember that the 24-hour average is 35 micrograms per cubic meter. That's 24 hours. We're talking about instantaneous, so it's going to be lower. Um, also, this is an HVAC room, so we have a filter. We're going to start in the back here. PM 2.5, number 0 to 35. 20. This one here? 0. All right, a little closer. This, this one here? 10. In the back? 5. All right, and in the corner here? 3. Okay, and you guys? 7. All right. So I was checking earlier, we do have a purple air sensor here, and it was reading right about three to four micrograms per cubic meter in this room. Excuse me? That was during, yeah. All right, and then outside, um, do we have any guesses for what it is outside? If it's three to four in here, you guys have a guess for outside? Five or eight, those are good. Any guesses here? What do you think the PM 2.5 reading is outside? 35? 25, okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good bet right there. So we can also, air now is a great place to go if you wanna find out what your air quality information is. The same data that's going to air now is also going to this uh, world air pollution um, index. And the index was, show, was showing earlier about the same AQI value for this area as it was indoors. So it's, it's low outside today. It's good air quality here. And we can zoom in. This one does have, that's honing in our location. It's not, not correct, but, oops. See this one here, if that works. Why is RTI coming up as New York? Yeah. So if you go to purple air, it's also showing about eight micrograms per cubic meter outside. All right, so the, the point of that exercise, the first one is that we are temperature aware and we are not so much air pollutant aware so if it's really bad or really dusty, we can smell it or it's in our nose or we trap a lot of that, we can, we can feel that. But if it's lower concentrations, a lot of times we're not gonna experience or know that. So air quality sensors give us the ability to measure what we can't see. 
and provide that information in a real-time manner for us in a map type format. So this is the sensor that we're providing in this project. This is called the Purple Air PA2 sensor. The reason it's called the PA2 is because it has two raw sensors inside. It's a very small sensor. It can be easily installed. It, uh, you can install it either with a single mounting screw or with zip ties. So you can zip tie it if you have a front of a porch and a back or uh, something that has kind of wrought iron easily mounted that way. It measures three different size fractions of particulate matter, PM10, PM2.5, PM1.0. Mostly for this project, we're gonna be focusing on the PM2.5 values that it produces. Also pr provides you a pressure, temperature, and humidity value. That sensor has two requirements that needs to be taken into consideration, especially when installing it. It needs to have power. So you have the power cable there and Wi-Fi. So it needs to be close enough to your Wi-Fi router that it can get a good signal and connect properly. So estimated cost of that sensor, if you were to buy it uh, from the website is about $230. We're providing it to you free of cost. And that cost is put there just to give you an indication of what that is versus the reference monitors, which are in the 15 to 20,000 range. So three steps to install. We have installation, Wi-Fi configuration, and registration. These are in the order of one, two, three. Do not think that you have to do them in that order, and sometimes it can be easier not to. So just a kind of a tip. You can do the Wi-Fi registration configuration and the registration first. So if it's cold outside, you can plug that device on in your office next to your Wi-Fi router and get everything configured and registered there. And then go outside in the cold and uh, mount that thing outside. And hopefully, if you unplug it, it'll maintain the Wi-Fi um, information that you put into it. So you don't have to redo that step. So this is a publicly available sensor. There's information online. This is the website to their install page. We're gonna go through kind of the instructions. You guys have also been provided a short um, kind of instructions inside the uh, package as well. So the first thing that you're gonna be doing is powering on your sensor. And there's a micro USB end. And that's gonna go right inside of the sensor that's here. And when you do that, you should see a red glow. And that red glow is a good indication that you do have power to your sensor. Once you have that red glow, you should be also having uh, the device will be broadcasting its own Wi-Fi that you will be using to connect to it and to configure it. And we'll talk about that in a slide. But since my order is installation first, we're gonna start with that. So where's a good place to install this sensor at your home? So as I said before, you need those two requirements, power and Wi-Fi. And you also may want to find a location that's not in direct sunlight, if possible. So here, that would be a north-facing wall. And find a location that's away from any particle sources. So if you have a, or anything that's generating wind. So if you have a air conditioning unit that's on the ground, you would want to mount it away from that. If you have a smoker or a barbecue, you definitely want to mount it away from that. If you use it a lot and uh, any air vents as well. The other thing too is just a safety consideration. Make sure you have it uh, in a way where it's mounted that the power supply is not a tripping hazard. And you can also use a drip loop, which is when you're plugging into the device, go like that. And then if water hits the line here, it's gonna drip off rather than go into the device. Everybody kind of see that drip loop example? This is plugged into the device, you would want the cable going like that. And then if water hits the cable, it's going to come down and drip rather than just because it's not going to go up the cable line. So choosing a location, we have installed a lot of these with uh, community um, groups and we have seen some good installations. We have seen some bad installations. And so it's always great to get a picture of the installation and so we can kind of take a look at it. There's the sensor mounted there. This is on the back porch. There's wrought iron in between those two pillars. And that's a good location. You can see that that sensor has a good view looking out. It, the air coming in is freely coming in, freely coming out. And it's able to be representative of, of a decent area from where that sensor is installed. Here's another example, kind of similar thing. That's a uh, north facing sensor as well. So it's the most of the reason for 
installing it on north side is actually for the temperature sensor. The temperature sensors tend to read high on these devices. And so if you keep it out of the sun, you'll get a more accurate temperature reading. Here is an example of one that's not a good siding installation. This one is mounted on a rooftop in Southern California in a media office actually. And that is an air conditioning unit that they zip tied it to first off. And then it's about an half an inch from the roof. So you can tell that this is not gonna be representative of air quality around this, even this building. It's really that micro environment where they installed it. And it's probably if they're gonna get dust from the top of that roof coming into it. And it's not gonna give good data, especially if you're putting that on a map. So that would be a bad um, site. So trying to find a spot that is gonna be representative for your neighborhood. So once you find a spot, then we need to register or Wi-Fi configure this device. So once you have it plugged in, you're gonna see that red light. It's gonna glow from the bottom and the device is going to emit its own Wi-Fi. That's gonna be named purple air underscore and then the last four digits of your sensor. So each sensor has a MAC address, which is a 16 digit number and that's printed on the front of your device. Um, if you do install it first, take a picture of that. So when you do register it, you'll have that information. You'll need that. And the last four digits here or last three digits are gonna be the last couple digits on your MAC address. When, these ones have been uh, configured before. So when you do plug it in, it may take a couple minutes for that Wi-Fi network to pop up. The reason is, is because it's searching for the Wi-Fi network it was previously configured with. And once it knows a couple minutes goes by, that Wi-Fi network is not in this area, it will then generate its own Wi-Fi network. What you're gonna do is connect to that Wi-Fi network with your cellular phone or a laptop. And once you hit connect, you will see something that looks like this. And it's gonna say internet is not available. That's okay because it's not connected to the web at this point. It's just the sensor putting out a Wi-Fi network that you're connecting to so you can configure that sensor. So once you're connected to the sensor, you're gonna take your phone and go into a web browser, Chrome or Internet Explorer, and type 192.168.4.1. That information will be on your printout, so you do not have to memorize that. That'll be a test afterwards. And that will automatically take you to a configuration page, which will look just like this. So you can see the Wi-Fi browser on the top. It's showing you the real-time um, air quality values. And you're gonna wanna click on the Wi-Fi settings. So right there. The Wi-Fi settings is gonna take you to this new page. And this is a page where you're going to look for your home Wi-Fi information. Your home Wi-Fi should be pulling up on here. So if it's um, our family Wi-Fi, find that, click on it. And then at the very bottom of that page, let's see if I can, it's not showing my complete. There, now you can see. The very bottom, it will show you the password, and then you'll be able to click on Save. Once you save that, it's gonna be saving your the SSID name of your Wi-Fi and the password, so you have to know what your password is. A lot of times that's on the um, modem itself for your Wi-Fi modem. So just a point here to stop and think is if you have a change in Wi-Fi provider, you will need to reconfigure your device. So. Remember that. So once you have updated that, you're gonna see that the Wi-Fi network is updated. You'll see this screen here. And it's gonna take a few minutes to connect and start to re be reporting data. After a few minutes, you're going to see that nice green Wi-Fi connected on the far right-hand side and say everything's looking good. At that point, you have a sensor that is connected to your home Wi-Fi internet and is now able to report data to a map. In order for it to actually put that data on a map, which is the purpleair.com map, you have to register it to give it a location and some additional information. 
So now you're good at that point, that Wi-Fi information will drop off after a certain amount of time and you'll no longer see that air monitor underscore Wi-Fi information. So once you have once you've completely configured it, you can click the register, which is right here. And that registration will automatically take you to the purple air registration page. And if you do that, it gives you a little bit of a head start because it'll automatically already know the MAC address information, which is that 16 digit number on the front of your device. And so when you do that, that first 16 digit number, which is right there will be input. So you'll put your 16 digit MAC address number there. Then you have to put an associated email address into, and this is project based. Um, so whoever purchases the sensor is the associated email. And so this is the email that needs to be used. This is uh, Olga's email address. And this is just for the associated email. So the device is associated to an email when it's purchased, not the registered owners. We'll get to that part. Put it that it's outside, and then you're going to be giving the location name. So all of these sensors have been named. The name is going to be NASA underscore AQ. CS for air quality citizen science, and then underscore, and then a number one to 100. And so each one of your devices should have that on the front with the uh, information on which number is yours. It's good if you keep that naming system correct. That way it's easy for um, us to track these devices. Um, if they're all named something random, it's a lot harder to find. And we'll also show you when we look at the purple air map and how it definitely helps with searching for sensors and finding um, all of the group's sensors. So after that, for visibility, you want to choose public so that everyone can see this. You don't have to sign into the map. And then you can choose on the bottom here. It's an interactive map. If you know your lat long specifically, you can plug that in. If not, you can drag it and uh, right to your location and get that sensor to your location. Now, you do have the option. You don't have to put it on exactly on your home. Um, you can put it on the street, so kind of in the middle if you want, right in front of your home. So then your neighbors don't know, hey, you know, they have the air quality sensor. You can put it more in a generic location, especially if you have the sensor mounted in a good location where it should be representative of the area. So if you want that privacy, you can go ahead and mount, you know, put the location of the sensor um, just a little bit off of the actual location. For the data processor step, do not change anything. Leave that the way it is. And then the device owner's information is where we need you to put in your information. This is gonna be your name, your email address. If you have a Gmail account, I would uh, recommend using that because then you can sign in when you're on the purpleair.com slash map and you can sign in and you can automatically go right to your sensor. And then if you want to, you can put in a, a phone number. I've registered hundreds of these sensors on my phone number. I've never gotten a text, so don't worry. I don't think you need to worry about that. And then at the bottom, let's exit. Hit I agree and register the sensor. And at that point, you should be getting data on the map. So the last thing I plan to show is going to be the actual purple air map and kind of the download, how do I get my data feature? So we're gonna exit the presentation. We're gonna go to the map. And here is the current map. Let's zoom out. So this is a popular sensor in the United States. There has been quite a few deployed, as you can see. So the first thing I wanna show you is the search feature. Once you have your sensor, you can search for it. And this search function not only searches for locations, so you can type in your address, you can also type in um, like RTI would pop up here. Or if you type in NASA, all of the sensors deployed by NASA would pop up. And that's one of the reasons we want you all to follow that naming convention that uh, we provide on there. So you can very quickly find your sensor, click on it that way. You can also use this button here, which looks kind of like the bullseye. You can click on that and that's gonna take you into your specific location, which again, we're in New York, if you didn't know. So 
I'll zoom back out. All right, a couple of things I want to show you with the map is when you typically sign in or jump in, it was going to be on US EPA PM 2.5 AQI. So this is an AQI calculation. Um, and so you, that's the layer that's being displayed here on the map. You can change that. So just say if we wanted to look at temperature, we can see how temperature changes across the United States. You're gonna see it's a little warmer on the West Coast. Got some hot here that seems really hot, 117, something's wrong there. And then something maybe cooler here on the East Coast down in this area. You can also look at humidity and uh, get an indication of where humidity is higher or lower based on that scale. And I like to use the, the raw PM 2.5, which is gonna be your um, concentrations in micrograms per cubic meter. Um, it's because an air quality scientist, if you prefer AQI, you can choose that. Um, it's still gonna color code the data with regards to the AQI. So let's zoom into New York, why not? And um, when you do choose a sensor, it's gonna pop up a box on the far left. That's gonna give you the values of the current map layer. So if you're in humidity, looking at the humidity map layer, this will be humidity. If you're in PM 2.5, it's gonna show PM 2.5. And you can click on another sensor and it'll also map that sensor as well on top of that map. So now we have both of those sensors in here on the bottom. We can click, get rid of some of the information. So it's all interactive. You just want the two, just the single. And then you can also zoom in on areas of interest. So you can see they had a peak there right around noontime in New York. Here's the login side of things. So if you did log in, you could log in using your Google account. And then you would be able to on the bottom choose, I just want to see my sensors. And then just your sensor would show up on the map if you wanted it to do it that way. All right, we ran through quite a bit in a short period of time. So are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. You can either put it on the outside. So if you have like a fascia, you can put it on the outside of the fascia or just directly on the inside of the fascia. You just don't want to push it way up into the fascia. You'd want to mount it so it's sticking underneath the, the bottom of the fascia. Does that make sense? So you put the screw in so it can kind of be. The other thing too is sometimes that puts an angle on the sensor as well. So you may want to just shim it out so you can get it um, a little bit more straight up and down. Yeah, that's fine as well. Yeah. It's a great question. So usually you, we like to be for um, like breathing height, somewhere from here. It can be a little bit higher too, depending on what's convenient. With citizen science type stuff, we, we like to make things um, not a tripping hazard. Things that are installed close to power and also something that's not um, in your way, something that's just an eyesore. So it's something that's up to you to kind of make the best judgment on. This is gonna be the best for taking air quality measurements, but also the best for my personal home. And I wouldn't wanna tell you, put it on your front door and everyone that walks in has to have a conversation with you. So you, you wanna put it somewhere where it's kind of maybe out of sight, out of mind, but also good for air quality readings and try and balance those two where you're, where you're doing both as good as you can. The last thing I did want to show was the download feature. So once you do find your sensor, yours is in New York, if you didn't remember, this button right here that has kind of the download, you hit that and that's going to take you to a download page. Here you can select which sensors you want to download. Remember I told you that your sensor has two raw sensors inside. So there's an A and there's a B. Ideally, those two sensors should be matching very well. If they're not, you can reach out to the project um, coordinators and we can uh, take a look at the data and possibly replace. 
and then you can download your data here. The PM 2.5 data is going to be in the primary, and the secondary is going to have some particle count information and six different size bins if you're interested. But primarily, you're going to be interested in the, the primary data. Yes? best practices for cleaning the sensors? Yeah, so a vacuum is a good one. We also use a vacuum on some of the sensors that we have deployed. A uh, small shop vac, or if you have like an attachment for your home vacuum, and you can just sit it on there for a couple, you know, maybe a minute and just pull whatever's in there. Turn it off first and then, and then do that. And uh, if you have a small clean paintbrush, you can also paintbrush the bottom as well. And then kind of, if you hit the fans a little bit, that'll help if there's any buildup on the fans. And that's uh, the Purple Air also recommends using a vacuum on their website. What's the impact? That's a good question. Trees, they, trees are planted on the sides of roads sometimes to be kind of a, uh, a block. So if you have an emission source and you have a lot of trees around it, they'll hit that tree and they'll kind of get deposited. So it can be a reduction. It's not going to be something that's going to make higher value. I mean, if you have a certain type of tree that has a lot that drops off or a lot of pollen that drops off, you may have an issue there. But what kind of trees do you have? Just cedars? Yeah. I would definitely try to stay away from mounting it very close to trees that, you know, drop a lot of pollen. But yeah, they can, they can either be a source or they can also be kind of a sink as well. <laughs> if you move a sensor, yeah, so if you move a sensor, the you would be redoing the Wi-Fi configuration because you'd probably have a new Wi-Fi information at the new location. And then you would also re-register the sensor. At that point, you'll be asked whether you would want to archive the old sensor data. And you'd probably want to name it differently as well. Because if you named it the same and you did not archive the data, there'd be one data um, stream for the same thing. Although at a certain point, there'd be a different lat long. So that's why you re-register it. So if you do move it, you have to re-register it, put that new lot long in, and that way Purple Air has that information and it shows up correctly on the map. If you do move it, please uh, let us know. Uh, and you will have to manually update that lat long uh, because it doesn't have a GPS. So it relies on what you input as the location. And that is important, particularly for the you know, quality of the data and for looking at the science questions. So, so if you do move, uh, let us know. I think a few feet, it of course, doesn't matter, but if you're going to relocate, then that's obviously a, something that we need to re-register. Yeah. Yes. The question was, if the power goes down, does, she, does the Wi-Fi configuration or the registration need to be reset? The answer is no. The sensor has non-volatile memory, so it saves that information on it, whether it's powered off, powered on, and uh, It'll still re recall that information and then just reconnect once it's powered back on. Yes, these are the new power supplies. Yes. How long ago? That was probably, I think that was about exactly a year or a year and a couple months ago. There was an issue with the power supplies. The main, the manufacturer had some issues with power supplies and that has since been resolved. All right. Any more questions? So in terms of the inst installation instructions, so there's a sheet in there. Uh, we will also email you uh, another set document that has, that will have that email address. Uh, that's needed, you know, that's associated with the sensor. Uh, 
So you'll need that information. If you didn't note it down, we'll be emailing that document as well. And he mentioned about these MAC ID and the sensor ID. So those are two different things. You will just need to, because the MAC ID is the one that's already imprinted on the sensor itself with the barcode type thing. And then the uh, sensor ID, the name is what we have, uh, you know, pasted on top of the sensor. So that's the one that NASA AQC is. That's a sensor name that we would like you to use. So. Exactly. Sensor name, okay. 